Hey friends, I'm Kathleen, the CEO and founder of Primal Trust. Thank you for coming to my YouTube channel. Please subscribe so that we can get this word out to the world about how healing happens from chronic illness, trauma, how to do brain retraining, vagus nerve toning, somatics, nervous system healing, and more. We also have a free ebook all on how healing happens with lots of great tools. You can find that link below the videos in the caption. And thank you for watching. Welcome everyone. Today I am gathered with Michelle Palmer, someone that I consider a dear friend and somebody who I've watched just go through such an amazing transformation. She also happens to be one of our teachers in the Primal Trust Academy and community. She's a physical therapist. She's a gifted somatic practitioner, and she has her own story of crawling out of the dark she was diagnosed with a lot of things, which she'll tell us more about, but some of them were Lyme disease, Babesia, chronic fatigue syndrome, insomnia, anxiety, and more. And we'll get to hear about that. And I'm also going to pick her brain a little bit all about somatics and why somatics is such an important part of the healing process. So for those of you who aren't familiar with somatics, please listen to the full interview to uh, learn all about that. So welcome, Michelle. Great. Thanks. It's so nice to be here with you, with everyone. I'm so happy that you would join us. I know that you have quite a story. So let's start with the laundry list of what you were diagnosed with, the laundry list of the people you saw, and a little bit about where you were at a few years ago and where you're at now. Okay. I'm going to read off a lot, some of them, because it's a list. So <laughs> like you like you shared, um, Lyme and Babesia, chronic fatigue, I had unbelievable anxiety. Like I was only sleeping one to two hours a night for years. And years? that created like let's, panic. Let's, oh. Wait, 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 back up. For years, did you just say? One to two hours yeah. a night. Let people hear that who have insomnia. <laughs> you get it, right? Yeah. I mean, honestly, if, if there was anything that was the worst, it was the insomnia that was making me feel crazy. And that happened for maybe four or five years. And I tried every medication. I tried everything. They put me on every single medication that they could. And um, none of it worked. Thank goodness, I feel like on some level. Otherwise, maybe I wouldn't be where I am today. But um, boy, I was I was like trial and error and everything, everything failed really with the sleep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And what else? I know you have more. What else? Okay. Are you <laughs> um, panic attacks, Epstein Barr. I had SIBO and I went all around searching for answers to the SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I had a like a chronic fasciculation disorder in my muscles where they were constantly twitching and firing and to the point where I actually ended up in a wheelchair for a little while. Um, couldn't walk. I couldn't do anything. The only thing I could really do was go in the pool and swim because um, I couldn't stand and I couldn't walk and, you know, small amount of time in a wheelchair as well, which uh, was a shocker to me that I would end up there. Um, and then I had GERD, which is, you know, reflux and some crazy TMJ issues that I had surgeries for and braces. And it was a whole fiasco that that trickled back to my sleep, uh, chronic muscle tension, vision disturbances, POTS, um, which is that postural orthostatic. What's the rest of that? Cat? Tachycardia syndrome. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, headaches, thyroid disorder. And I had a, a couple of concussions as part of the uh, perfect storm. So I hope people that are listening understand those of you who have went, you know, been diagnosed with it all. You're so not alone. That's quite a list, Michelle. And I can't imagine with all of those diagnoses, also not getting any sleep for not months, but years. Yes. Um, and how frustrating that would be. I mean, you're a professional, you're a physical therapist, you've been trained and to be so stuck what kind of, I mean, what kind of help were you trying to get in all those years? Like, where did you go to get help and how did you eventually end up in primal trust? Oh, um, so I, you know, I, I ride the middle path. So I was going to all of the doctors and everything because my background is medical. My family's a bunch of doctors and I wanted to give that, that an opportunity because of the belief system within my family. And I know that medicine can also be very helpful. And then I also went sort of the left-handed path, which was, you know, all this other um, accessory and also, I don't know, spiritual and massage and body work. So the list is also just as long as the, um, 
the symptoms I had. So I saw a variety of medical doctors. I saw neurologists and sleep doctors, acupuncturists, functional medicine doctors, some of the best in the country too. Uh, naturopaths, herbalists, shamans, rolfers, massage therapists, psychiatrists, gastroenterologists, chiropractors, functional neurologists, psychiatrists. And I went to the Cleveland Clinic. I went to Stanford. I went to Mayo. I did a lot of work in Boulder and also in Bozeman. So it's, it's, I saw everybody. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and so like I had gotten to a point, Kat, where um, it's a hard that subject to speak about, but I couldn't imagine where my life was um, at that moment in time. And could I possibly continue to live? I had really sunk to, I mean, a massive depression as well, because who I had known myself to be and who I had evolved into was such a radical shift in what was possible in my mindset. So I was, I mean, suicidal is a hard word to speak to, but I knew that my life had to change because there was no way that I could continue on that particular path. And I have been seeing some incredible acupuncturists in Boulder and this wonderful uh, practitioner named Bob Quinn. And Bob said, you know, Michelle, I have seen a person who had Lyme disease and nothing was helping her. And she, so he ended up recommending Joe Dispenza, the Gupta program in DNRS um, as options. And so I started with the Gupta program, thinking that that was the way. And um, as much as it was wonderful, I don't think I was in a place to really navigate that. So then I ended up in DNRS, which a friend of mine had also mentioned. And that was a big shift for me to at least get my mindset to um, quiet down and to tamp down the dysregulation enough where I could start to feel some of the symptoms and things like that begin to decrease. And that's that's when I knew that the brain retraining um, was, was going to be a miracle for me because that was the only thing of all the things I shared with you that actually helped. And I tried every, all the meds and everything as I shared. And so I started down that path for about six or eight months. And as helpful as it was, I felt like there were some really big missing pieces for me that um, those programs or that particular program didn't answer. And I also went into Dispenza and did a lot of Dispenza work, which was also really wonderful, but not specific enough for me. And I heard you speak on um, rewiring your wellness. <laughs> the first time I think like you ended you ended up there because Falgany couldn't be in there or something. So you took her space and I heard you talk. And I thought, you know, she's the person that I want to study with and learn more. It sounds like you had been through so much yourself, your own journey, and you'd been digging and looking around and exploring and trying things. And um, that's how I ended up in Primal Trust. Wow. Amazing. And that was, gosh, what, three years ago now, maybe? Yeah, three years ago at this at this same time. Oh, mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, tell me about what primal trust gave to you that was different and what started to happen with your body to bring you where you're at now. And just for a, um, uh, what's a spoiler. I mean, you <laughs> told me you just went snow, uh, cross country skiing for hours yesterday, right? I mean, yeah. you're, you are, you're, you're living, you're functional, you're doing amazing. So let's, let's kind of go back a few years ago. What started to happen to bring you to where you're able to do these kind of things today? I think, you know, one, of, there's a couple of profound things that are embedded in the course above the primal trust course. And I do want to say that I was before you had um, the, the somatic expression classes in the beginning. What's the name of that class? I just forgot the name. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the mentorship. No, well, like uh, the ones that you offer now that are like step one before you enter oh, into primal trust. Yeah, level one regulate. Um, where we had back then we had creating calm, but it wasn't. Yeah, out out yet. Yeah, so it was before any of that, and um, I guess um, the most important thing is finding my true self. 
like that was profound to, to remind myself and remember myself and who I know myself to be without all of the symptoms and without all of the crazy expression of my thoughts the to go in and discover and find those qualities within myself and practice every single day, reminding myself and re like re um, absorbing the memory of what, what I, and who I know myself to be. And also even more than that, like I think who I knew myself to be cat before was great, but I was even bigger than that because there was so much, I think from before the perfect storm that was leading me into, that led me here as well. That was unresolved trauma, unresolved uh, beliefs that came down through my family line that was really embedded in my nervous system and my thought processes and for certain my body. So um, discovering and remembering that so that I could create this space of, okay, this is what I'm experiencing now and this is who I am. And then finding um, the practices and the experience to come back to uh, what is my center and my higher, truer self. Yeah, you were, um, you were so, it was so beautiful to watch you really gravitate to that work of self-discovery and you know, you were one of the first in my first pilot run of the Primal Trust Mentorship, where I noticed there was a gap in the brain retraining community that people were doing brain retraining, but they weren't doing it with a purpose, like a real purpose of self-discovery. And I would ask, like, what are you guys even rewiring towards? Who are you really? It's not just about rainbows and unicorns and happy. It's about, um, Re reclamation of what was lost. And I loved the zest that you had to reclaim yourself and to use these tools, not just for the sake of calming down, but to, you know, opening up the walls inside of you that uh, had been put there out of protection and, and finding yourself again. And that, that was really beautiful to witness you go through that. Mm. Thanks, Kat. It yeah. was such such deep work and really part of the the blooming or the budding. Like I think that created that little tight bud of a flower mm -hmm. that then is continuing to blossom. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to share too, which I found to be so quintessential, is you know, I had done some internal family systems work, which of course I think is very valuable. And I'll speak to that in a moment. But what I noticed in the work is that it never allowed me to really fully also, you know, develop that sense of, of self and knowingness. You know, I would touch on it and feel it, but it wasn't a practice that I did every day, multiple times a day. And if I think about like going to a therapist or which I did do that too, maybe it's once a week or once every two weeks or how, however often I visited them that I could have that experience. And so Primal Trust gave me the framework to be able to do that myself with all of the focus and time and um, uh, like everything that you provided us in terms of how we learn to get to know our parts mm -hmm. and in a very intimate way and all of the structure around getting to know our parts and the different ways that they express themselves or the way that they hide and not in like the nice way, going into the shadow and how important it was and it is still for me to find safety into going into those places. And what provides that is that knowingness of, you know, my true self and who, who I really am. Hmm. That's such a beautiful description of what parts work really could and should be, which is a daily, it's not just meeting once a week. Yeah. With a therapist, it's, it's a daily searching for and finding, and, uh, it takes work. It takes dedication to do that, which you did, um, so beautifully. So tell us more, how does this story continue to unfold? So it felt like as soon as that started to open, I could really sense more space within myself. Um, 
And of course, the symptoms slowly began to ebb and flow, honestly. It's not a smooth, lovely path. I know that you've shared that and everyone who's come on. It has the, these waves. And I just learned to trust more in the, the journey. And I, I now perceive it really as an, a, a journey to my awakening. And um, it created the space really for me to be grateful. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts that's come out of this is the gratitude, obviously, for you and the practice and this beautiful community and opportunities, but to notice that what seems so awful and horrid in my life um, is really part of my transformation that has allowed me to heal and nourish some of the old belief systems and parts within me that were really the driving force to what was creating my sickness or my unwellness and my dysregulation. So like just, it gave me a well in which to go in and explore and feel safe and to do it in the space of community and with others really, um, really allowed me to see and feel that I'm not alone and that there is safety in, in doing this work. So for people who are listening, who have a lot of the type of symptoms, diagnosis you have, what would you say is the root root of all of that? I mean, you've kind of said it, but what is, what was the root of your dis-ease and illness, et cetera, and what needed to happen to shift that? Mm. There's a couple of things, you know, I, I sometimes hesitate to use the word trauma for whatever reason, but small T, capital T, there were things that happened in my childhood that got suppressed and protected and guarded against. And some of them were just normal living. It, it's not like my parents were bad parents, but communication style and things like that and how I was shut down. Um, and also there was some abuse in my family that I can speak openly about, um, some childhood abuse with my brothers that created a very interesting dynamic of protection. And the, the enormous amount of protection, which showed up like judgment, criticism, beliefs that I wasn't good enough, beliefs that I was unlovable, um, beliefs that I was unworthy, and all of those you know, had their role in my psyche that kept me in the cycle of believing that that's actually true. And if I, if I really feel into my body around that, it just creates a lot of internal turmoil, not only within my mind, but within my nervous system and how that speaks to uh, the rest of my body. And I believe that the perfect storm of everything that happened um, was one thing, but it was really all of this underneath that needed to bubble up, that needed to be felt, that needed to be heard by me and, uh, and understood, not in the brain, but in the way of, you know, humanity and, um, and that I'm not broken, most of all. <laughs> That is such a vulnerable share. Thank you to um, help others understand that the setup for all of this is often deep wounding and deep beliefs that are um, very self, uh, anti-self in some ways, beliefs that set our system, our nervous system up, and therefore our immune system and all sorts of things up for the kind of issues that you've had. And you know, so what started happen? what, what did happen with your symptoms as you, you know, you know, you were doing the whole medical route and then you started to really look inward, um, and uproot some of that. What, what started happening with your symptoms? <clears throat> I guess one of the, one of the really surprising things is my whole life I had, I've lived in my body. I'm a very body or oriented person. I climb and I cycle and I ski and I do yoga and I met, I do all the things. And, um, I prided myself on like the relaxed body because 
there was a, a long period of time where I was very relaxed. And as I started doing the work, it's almost like it had to move out of my body. And I started initially, it was a little scary, admittedly, more and more tension like I had never felt in my body before. My neck and my shoulders and my jaw, everything sort of cemented in. And I remember going to my massage therapist and I was like, this is crazy what's happening. And it was like moving from the inside out and and then I found over time that my muscles, my body started to soften and receive life more because I I can sense that part of that gripping and holding was a bracing mm -hmm. against life, a protecting. And as I started to do the work, I realized that I didn't need to protect myself. What I really needed is to learn to open and soften and receive life and not fight it and not resist it and find the ways um, in which to, to communicate and nourish myself on a very deep level. And then all of that stuff began to soften. My sleep, I have to say, like I was talking to my friend <laughs> Janet this morning and um, I was celebrating, like I had seven and a half hours of sleep last night and like it's become regular and um it's it's been slow i think the sleep was the hardest mm -hmm. so um it has been the slowest but i am patient and i'm loving with myself and another thing i wanted to share is i used to be a really big pusher and an achiever and there was a lot in my background as a family that that sort of hardwired that into my system so as i began the process of understanding you know mentally and physically what it means to push and what i was doing to myself and having high expectations um, was really detrimental and and part of i think what created this whole uh, journey hmm. yeah, wow. it got a lot of things got a little bit more intense my headaches got so much better. My vision started to really change. I had my blood work done and the Lyme was gone and the Babesia was gone. Epstein-Barr was gone. The chronic fasciculations in my legs, that slowly over time began to disappear as I became more and more regulated. And out of curiosity, were you actively treating Lyme and Babesia and Epstein-Barr or was this a just to grab an, a side effect of the work that you were doing? I stopped, tre I stopped treating it because it was like an enormous amount of medicines that I, I on, on, thank goodness I had a little element of intuition just saying, no, 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 no more. Um, and so I stopped all the antibiotics and all of the crazy herbs that I was on. Um, and then I, I was on benzos because that was for sleep that didn't work, but they kept increasing my dosage of benzos. Mm -hmm. And so on my own and with um, a very heavy schedule, I slowly and took my time, got off of the benzos and all of the other medicines that psych, basically psych medicines that they were just trying to see. So I really basically did all of that without. Wow. Um, wow. And it, and I, I, unfortunately or fortunately, when they put me all the anti-anxiety medications and things, those didn't help me either. And in fact, they maybe made it worse. So um, I didn't have to get off too many of those, but it was just a, as I, I kind of played with, as I started to trust myself in the process more, then I could start to decrease the medicines and, you know, in a very nice, slow fashion. Amazing. What an amazing story for people who are listening, like that these things can heal these incurable things that you can get off from medications that you don't have to take a tremendous amount of herbs to like keep Lyme at bay the rest of your life, things like that. I love that because this gives people hope and it shows people that that deeper work that you described, facing the things that really scared you, facing the suppression and letting the body start to express and unravel allowed your immune system and nervous system to, um, to start to self-heal. Yeah. Yeah. It's been beautiful and such a gift. And 
as you were saying, unraveling, it also feels like an unthawing, you know, like also that, like just the concrete nature in which my beliefs were so rooted to the point that I wasn't really aware even like until I started doing the work and, and looking deeper into myself that I began to recognize how that was always kind of playing in the background, unbeknownst to me. And now, like, I want to share some things that are happening now, like, you know, as life is, there are very, you know, dynamic situations going on, maybe in my health or my husband's health, or even family dynamics or friend dynamics. I have built an unbelievable capacity um, to hold myself in a loving place and then also to create more space around the experience so I'm far less reactive than I ever was. And if a judgment rises, I have a whole new way of um, working with that with myself and others because that's such an important play is it's not just about ourselves, but it's also about how we interact and how we dance in the world. Mm -hmm. And I can be a testament to your capacity. I know you've been through a tremendous amount with your family and to watch you so gracefully and powerfully and also softly navigate that. Um, and that you've, you've just remained in your power throughout the challenges that I've watched you walk. It's, it's phenomenal. And it says a lot about the capacity that you have built both with your brain and your somatic nervous system and your um, internal family system and understanding those parts and what they say and how to respond. Um, so beautiful, truly. Thanks. What, you know, one thing, go ahead. One yeah. thing I wanted to say too is like, I have done all of these things. Like you and I are similar in the way that we explore and we try new and different things and we try it for ourselves, but we also try it because we work with others. Mm -hmm. And I, I had all of these different tools, but it felt like primal trust was the hub that really, <laughs> that really allowed me to put them all together because I was doing them. I was doing all of the things, but it wasn't sinking in in a way because I hadn't tended to opened, listened, heard what was underneath it all. So I'm glad I'm so grateful for all the practices and all of my teachers. And this practice has been the one that allowed me to integrate all of the work into, um, into myself and mm -hmm. have them be effective in, in a new and different way and be deepening practices for myself. That's a really nice description of what I intend this community to be a hub of lots of things, not just the brain retraining, but also somatics. And speaking of somatics, Michelle happens to be um, our original somatics teacher as Primal Trust was developed and has been a, a great space holder for that. And a lot of people who are listening to this, they might know what brain retraining is, but you know, they, maybe they've done DNRS or Gupta, et cetera, but they don't really know somatics. And that is one of the key things that, that we try to encourage everyone in primal trust to, um, learn. Could you explain a little bit about what somatics is and why it's so important and, and how maybe somebody who only knows brain retraining, how they would begin to like weave somatics into their practice? Mm, that's such a juicy question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, some, I feel like somatics is an umbrella of experiences that can happen from so many different kinds of practices that allow us to play or has allowed me really to play in the field of where it all plays out is in the body. And I felt like when I was doing the brain retraining that it was great for my mind and it was great for helping me discover clarity and see, um, you know, judgment or create spaciousness in my brain. But it felt like something was missing in the programs. And that is the body, because that's where we experience and feel life. Um, and we experience, obviously, the symptoms, too. But we also experience all of our emotions, our feelings, our sensations, our fears, our regrets, our joys, our happiness, 
everything shows up in, in the space and in the realm of the body. And so when I go in to myself and explore, um, I, I thought about this a little bit before we got together because it's such a huge topic. And um, what I realized the most is how important it was for me to slow down. And when I do somatic practices, some have more of that slowing down than others, that it gave me the space within my body to build a sense of safety, but also to learn to listen and how important it is because the body is the one that bubbles up the sensations that sort of bubbles up that unconscious thinking patterns. And so somatics is just um, an exploration of how to touch in and create, it's almost like the body creates the space for all of this to be there and find a sense of, um, of deep connection with all of life through the body. Because without the body, I, I mean, I, I don't even know what would we be. We would be, you know, out in the end, we'd be stars and, you know, water and, and the trees and the elements. And so um, that's another part, I think, in somatic exploration is we are the body, but we're also more than the body. Mm, that's so beautifully said. What would you say to somebody? I've heard this a lot from new people who try somatics, who maybe have more of like this, a lot of ADHD type behavior where they're like, I'm so bored or I feel stir crazy. What do you say to those people as they're starting to get into somatics and they're kind of like, ah, inside, because it's just so it's slowing and listening and they just their body is kind of guarded against that. What would you say to them? Mm. Well, I'd probably say that there's like a variety of things and I, to try and, you know, there's five rhythms and there's um, journey dance. There's a, a lot of those kinds of practices that can really meet you where you're at, at that point in time. And anytime really that's, those are beautiful practice, even yoga and Qigong, all of those practices are designed to um, to to meet you in a way where you feel like you could touch in. So it might be choosing a particular practice as a way of entering in. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is we're always going to have resistance to slowing down. And I mean, that's sort of hardwired into a nervous system that's been stuck in flight, flight, freeze. It's either frozen and doesn't want to move or it's like spinning out of control and dropping into a place where it's slower might feel a little bit um, scary for the nervous system or unsafe. And so I like the idea of titrating in. That's where the BBNR kind of work is really great or, or these small little um, practices that you do to teach you how to go in and learn to be with sensation, to stay a little while, titrate while you're in there, and then come back out and notice how you feel. Mm -hmm. like one of the things that, and it might not always feel good. I mean, that's a fact, right? The nervous system is like, this is new. This is crazy. I'm afraid. I'm going to get a little bit more wound up because, yeah. because it's scary. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because sometimes we throw the whole practice out because it makes us feel worse. And we think, oh, that's not going to be good. I know for me, like when I very first started doing somatics, um, you know, back in PT school, I started crying every single time I felt vulnerable. I felt overwhelmed. I would get flooded. And then, you know, even when I was really sick, there were years that I couldn't, I couldn't go in there even with my physical therapy and somatic training. Like it was hard. I didn't, cause I was trying to do it myself. So speak to like, maybe the importance of like, if that's you, like having some type of space holder helping you with your somatic practices, because that is something that you do and why that might be a nice route for people who can't quite hold that space for themselves. Mm, yes. Um, it, it, I think when we practice together, or actually I feel it more than I think it, when we come in and practice together, it's like a whole new space is being created and we're all having our own experiences, but we're all being held in the same trust and we're all being held by that same loving force to help us begin to feel, if not within ourselves, that sense of co-regulation. That admittedly, I, when I first started teaching online, I thought, 
this isn't how do you find that online? We're not in the same room together. And yet it is so palpable and so felt that um, that other people, when we share at the end of class, have said how important it is to find that sense of practice with each other. It helps us build our own sense of safety and our own sense of comfort and the ability to stay. Um, you know, it's sort of like a puppy, sit, stay, you know, and the puppy's going to run off. So, you know, giving oneself the permission to know that, okay, the mind's going to run off or emotions are going to rise or feelings and sensations are going to arise. And yet I can still come back to be in this circle and learn really how to be with all of it. That part that really wants to go wild and overthink and get anxious and frustrated and angry too. Like I used to have a lot of anger when I slowed down. Like, I was so mad. Like, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. And then I watched myself and I thought, well, that's fascinating. What, what inside of me would make me so angry and frustrated and antsy that slowing down really created such a tidal wave of sensations? I totally have the same experience and I still do sometimes. I mean, just the other day I was trying to do a slow Feldenkrais practice and reminded me of you. I'm like, oh, this is so Michelle. It's very slow. <laughs> and like the person was like speaking like really kindly and like, and I'm like, I'm not a baby. Don't talk to me like I'm a baby. <laughs> I, you know, I was in a mood where I could feel that part of me that didn't want to be slow. I didn't want to be like soft. And I'm like, what is that all about? And I could feel how like, oh, there was like a lot of judgment going on in the moment of things that I should be doing. And this voice that was trying to get me to slow and be kind was not matching my inner voice at the same time. And it really gave me a reflection. And I think those of us who've been like the pusher achievers, et cetera, that slowing down and kindness can provoke a lot of anger because it goes against our whole like oper you know operating system how did you mm -hmm. i mean i so how did how do you transform that what would you say in that moment or what would you do if you notice you're getting angry or the the counter voice is kicking up when you're trying to do somatic work well sometimes i just let myself go there altogether and have those feelings like you know F and this, F and that, like, you know, and, you know, just get really upset and have those feelings or run around the room. Like when I was a kid, I used to stomp around. Like that was a thing for me, stomping around and uh, yelling and, you know, whatever. And it's like, maybe instead of suppressing, because there is a balance in, in the practices of never gaslighting oneself, but also, am I suppressing what's rising? And, and I just feel like, I don't really encourage the suppression and give yourself the space. So some people go to sleep in my class and I'm like, that's fine. And I also give full permission to people to like get up and move around or do a movement in a faster mm -hmm. way, or, you know, that's an option. And then come back to yourself and see how you feel. It's like creating an open awareness or open attention to allow yourself to have the feelings that, that are rising. And then also noticing, oh, is this a habit? Is this a pattern that's just every time it rises, every time I slow down, does that mean I need to do deeper work and go in and explore more? Or can I find an, another way to meet it that's not like the opposite? Like you need to like, okay, I wanted to speak to this because I used to have a part that was a spiritual part that was like, you are Zen. You practice all the time. You know how to do the work. And that was a part. <laughs> That was a part that was not my true self either, that I had to work with that that is not the antidote necessarily is to be Zen and calm. It's like to move the energy. That's why five rhythms and those kinds of practices are really wonderful. I mean, there's so many yoga, Qigong, African dance. There's so many. And it's just like finding, finding the ways. And maybe there's one way for a while, but I always think, this is why I was kind of loving my work is there is always space to slow down. And a lot of that work doesn't teach that as much. And I feel like that might be a slow practice. So you could come to class for a little bit and go, go, and then come back. You could sit and listen. Um, that's an option and just notice what rises. I love Those it. 
<laughs> I love it. You're, you're so, I love how you invite, um, the tantrum if that needs to come out instead of like, Oh no, no, no. That's, it's one of the things I love about you. You're so real. You meet people where they're at. And for those of you who don't know, Michelle teaches every other Thursday. Is that right? What we're doing every other Thursday in primal trust. And, um, it's, you know, it's amazing. She's got all these videos in the library. Um, so in addition to have an amazing testimonial, she's an amazing asset to our community, but you also have some of your own stuff that you're, I want to know what's ahead for you with your somatic offerings. What are you interested in doing and bringing into the world? Well, a couple of things. I, I want to just speak to uh, my many teachers that I've okay. had. Um, but um, I do a lot of women's work and that's really has been my passion for 30 years and working with pelvis, pelvic health, the uterus, the vagina, um, everything that starts in the root chakras. And I've done so much hands-on work and I'm just trying to transfer some of that work into um, practice that people can do in community and also I mean, it's just a storehouse of where so much shame and guilt and disconnection happens for men and women alike, but certainly for women with our menstrual cycles and, you know, all of the shame and guilt and or trauma that is stored in, um, in our pelvis and our uterus and how it impacts our heart. Because when we feel a disconnect from such a big area of creation for women and we're shutting that area down then we're shutting down a big area of our heart and our ability to really feel so deeply in the world. And, you know, our femininity or our bodies can give us so much pleasure. And that's another thing that's sort of shut down. So I really want to, this is, this is like my leading edge. I was talking to Kat about this before our class of creating structure so I can put something like this together for us. So, you know, all the women's health work, and I've spent a lot of time with Rosita Arvigo and all of the Mayan abdominal massage work and visceral manipulation and intravaginal work that we can do on ourselves for healing and nourishing and finding a new connection with an area of our body that carries so much, maybe not in this lifetime, but from, you know, you can look at women all around and see what we've been working with for for eons. So that's a piece of it. The other piece that I'm excited about as I spend more time with Susan Harper, one of my teachers, she um, she's all about the elements and how do we find our sense of connection through um, the elements, especially say water and just feeling that interconnectivity that we have just by um, uh, our creation as humans with other animals, with other species, with um, the mountains, the rock, the air, and finding more qualities of that within ourselves and the exploration of sound and how do we integrate all of that into this human form through um, through movement and through discovery of of what it might be like to be a jellyfish or a starfish or a wolf or or water that's flowing quick, quickly through or a breeze that's passing by. That sort of reciprocity of I am that too and how do I experience what is being experienced in the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now you put that into a class, I am not sure, but I'm <laughs> gonna play with, with that because it's so nourishing. Like I have, I've never been so nourished before in, in the work and it allows for everything to be expressed and felt. Hmm. I think it would be such an asset for people to be able to receive of your work through these classes because they are so nourishing and to yeah, have these resources available. So I hope that you get these, um, put together for sure. I will be encouraging you to do so. And, um, where can people find you? Like, what's your website so that people can find more about you? Oh, uh, www.embodiedwisdom-health. That's my website. And I've been thinking, you know, for a while I was putting videos out and doing some things and I'm, I'm hoping to get back to doing that, to sharing more, but I just want to say that, 
also how important somatics is. There is like, I wanted to speak for a second to Feldenkrais and like, that is brilliant work. There's so many brilliant works that can help the brain sort of retrain and learn um, new movement patterns and new facets within the nervous system. And also um, the softness that we can meet ourselves in really creating space of knowing that there are deep emotions that are felt in the body. And all of these practices can elicit that, but how important it is to learn to slow down and feel and listen, because that is quintessential to hearing the wisdom of yourself. And that's what creates um, the wisdom and the healing of transformation. I agree a hundred percent. I actually think that the entire purpose of doing brain retraining, vagus nerve toning is to actually be able to have the capacity to come in into the body and listen. And that ultimately somatics is where the deepest healing happens. Um, you know, and if we miss that piece, we're kind of missing a whole discovery, um, a, a whole full transformation that can happen. Sometimes mm -hmm. people do brain retraining, vagus nerve toning, and their symptoms will start to go away and they'll just kind of go on into their life. And they actually miss a deep opportunity that might be there had they taken their practice into the body and mm -hmm. um, discovered some of the things that you described today. Yeah, because all of the emotions live everywhere. Mm -hmm. The emotions and the feels and they get tucked away and hidden and, you know, shut, shut away into the deep, dark closet at the recesses anywhere, but in the bottom of the pelvis or the armpit or the jaw. I mean, the jaw, for instance, carries so much anger often or just holding and gripping of life. And if you just brain retrain it, you know, that's a beautiful thing, but also it's that like that flow of body mind together and that's why that the body piece is so important to know and, and give yourself the permission to feel mm -hmm. and to feel what's being held and stored in, in our cells and in our tissues and fluids. I love it. I think that's a great summary that somatics is learning how to give ourselves permission to feel and explore. Mm -hmm. uh, so beautiful. Now, I always ask this question. What advice would you have if you were to be talking to you five years ago when you were like in the thick of it? What um, what would you have done differently? What would you want to say? You know, when you didn't know what to do and you've just got all these diagnoses and all these protocols, um, you know, you've said a lot of these things, but what is your wisdom that you've gained that you'd like to give back to those that are listening as if you were giving back to you then? I'm back. Okay. <laughs> Did you hear the question? What What would I say or um, yeah. encourage others that maybe I didn't receive or what yeah. would I do different? Yeah. Ooh. You know, that's a great question too. Um, you know, in some ways there's a perfection in, in how it all unfolded, but I also recognize like, I don't know if I had anybody on the other side letting me know, because I didn't really know anybody who did the work. I guess I would just encourage um, consistency and trust and uh, self-compassion. And I just feel like the compassion practices are so valuable and being open to whatever rises, even in, in the resistance, knowing that in time, things will shift and change because that's just the nature of life. But the more that I resisted, the heart, the more embedded I became, like my heels dug in and I felt like I was almost like, oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I was like committed to my sickness. Like I, I, this is who I am. This is what is happening in my life. Don't you see I'm struggling and and, and do you not see me? And I felt like, as I look back, the more I did that, um, 
I mean, maybe it's what helped me meet myself, but the more I resisted uh, letting go, the harder in some ways it was. And as soon as I began to really allow more space and practice and being curious, I, I think that that's the most probably important piece, curiosity with love and compassion um, is probably the biggest medicine for transformation because once we lose our curiosity and we think we know the way, that's like, that cuts off the possibility for growth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, what else? Laughter and joy and having fun <laughs> um, to find a way to weave that in and music um, because I, I feel like music High energy music is wonderful and also music that softened down and allowed me to feel, to really give myself permission to feel the sadness and the grief and and, and the shame that could rise up from, from just music alone. Beautiful. Thank you. So many pearls of wisdom today. Um, and I'm so grateful that you are doing so well and you've come so far and you're able to help you know thousands of people watching your classes and you know making a difference in the world and i know that um you know for those listening who haven't been to michelle's class they're phenomenal she's so nourishing as you could feel here on this interview just her voice and her approach um, is a really beautiful invitation to the body so Thank you, Michelle, for sharing. Any Anything else that I didn't cover that you want to say before we close? No, I think just how grateful I am. I was, you know, I spoke to the gratitude before, but um, I feel so strongly of the community that you've created and the teachings and all the work that you did. And I know you pulled out a lot of hair and <laughs> lost some tea, you know, yeah. the, the that you've done, but but the work that the community is doing together and how how much of a safe space it is and to really dive into that, um, even amidst the resistance and just feel the resistance and the resistant parts, but this community is such a healing space and there's so much wisdom and the forum is filled with so much opportunity. And of course the classes and the teachers are really great. And like, if you ever feel like lost or alone, like reach out. That's the thing. We get so we get so embedded in going inside and it becomes so lonely. And I just feel like that's what this community is for is to to recognize that you're not alone. And that in itself is very, very healing. And people listen and people want to love and um they we want each other to heal. Wow. That I I think that is a great place to end. That was so beautiful. And I just want to say that this primal trust is a co-created thing. It's so not about me. It's literally people like you who have been there from the beginning, who held that vision with me of what healing could look like if we came together. So thank you, Michelle, for all that you've done to contribute to primal trust as well. Thank you, Kat. So blessed. <laughs>